Good morning, Christ Fellowship. I hear a few of you. Good morning. I'm so glad you guys are here to help us worship the King. Uh, before we do that, though, we do have a couple of announcements we'd like to make. Thank you, Troy. Uh, yeah, I'm very excited to be able to share that once again this year, we're going to be having our Good Friday community gathering here at Christ Fellowship. It will be from 6 to 7 p.m. on Friday, April the 15th. And yes, Troy, Good Friday falls on tax day this year. So make sure you have your taxes filed. Make sure you filed your extension and then come and join us as we honor our Lord with communion and with worship and as we remember all that he has done for us. There's no need to RSVP for this service and we want you to understand this is a family type gathering so we won't be having any family ministries with kids and students. So grab your family, grab your children, grab your friends and come and join us as we honor our Savior and we remember the sacrifice that he made for each and every one of us. We hope to see you Friday, April 15th right here at 6 p.m. And immediately following uh, Good Friday, of course, will be our Easter service. Um, if any of you have heard your enemy whisper in your ear that you're not loved, that you can't be loved, or that you've done something that just precludes you from being loved, that's a lie from the enemy. We know that. When Jesus was here, he said, no man has greater love than this, that he laid down his life for his friend. Jesus came and laid down his life for you. He sacrificed for you. He paid your penance for your sins. He restored you back into fellowship with the king. He will never leave you nor forsake you. So on Easter service, we'll be celebrating his resurrection. We'll be celebrating his life. We'll be celebrating his sacrifice that he made for each one of us. So we'll have our normal services. Uh, at 9 a.m. and 11 a.m., but we've added a third service for Easter. There'll be a 1 p.m. service. So in order to make certain that we have made all the necessary arrangements and that we have everything prepared for you, we do ask that you RSVP for the Easter service, not the Good Friday service, but the Easter service, if you will. Go online to rsvp.christfellowship.me uh, and just let us know what service you'll be attending and how many of you will be attending with you, and we'll make certain we have all the necessary arrangements. Yeah, definitely looking forward to that. So now as we transition into a time of worship and we posture our hearts for worship, we want you guys to know that we want each and every one of you as you worship this morning to experience the presence of God, to experience the love and the peace and the joy that is rightfully yours because of your relationship with Christ. And so as you worship this morning, we want you to know that you have freedom, freedom to express yourself as you worship your Heavenly Father. For some, that expression may be singing loudly. Others may sing quietly and some may not sing at all. Some may clap their hands or raise their hands or move and dance and others stand still and sit or even kneel and bow. But know that you have freedom to respond to your Father this morning and to receive from Him. And who better to receive from than the one who knows exactly what you need. So I want to encourage you, posture your hearts for worship. Set aside the worries and cares of today, of tomorrow, of next week, your issues and your problems. Set your hearts and your minds, set your focus and attention on Him, your Heavenly Father, and experience His love, experience His presence, because the truth is He is here, and He loves you more than you could ever think or imagine, and He knows exactly what each and every one of us need. All right, stand, and we will pray. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you for this day. We thank you for this opportunity to come and worship you, Lord, to celebrate what you've done for us, the sacrifice that you've made for us, Lord. Lord, accept our sacrifice of praise, Lord, to help accept our offering to you of thanksgiving and praise and worship in your name, Lord. I bless all those that are here in attendance that are listening to this service online, Lord, that they would be touched that they would meet you in this time of worship and this time of message. We thank you for all that you've done for us and all that you will do for us. In Jesus' name.
breaks the darkness. You're the mighty one, the risen sun, and you're the savior to the drowning. And I was lost till you found me. You broke the chains that have bound me. You're the mighty one, the risen sun. Suffered in 
and in your holy church I believe in the resurrection when Jesus comes
praying about what that means because so many times the presence of the Lord can feel so abstract to us or so far away or all of these beautiful statements that we've been singing can seem like things that were so long ago and we say we believe them, but what does that really look like? What does that mean for us? Um, and so as I was praying about it, I felt like the Lord was was showing me how he shows up in everything and how he shows up in conversations that we'll have with our friends and family this morning. Or maybe he gave us a little extra piece as we were rushing out the door this morning, which we all know is hard to come by, especially if you have children. <laughs> um, but he's just reminded me that this song and these statements are declarations and that when we sing them out and we are standing on them and believing in them, that there is power and worship in that. And so I just wanna take a moment for us to ask the Lord, what is something that we say we believe about you, but maybe we really have a hard time walking in that truth? Maybe we have a hard time believing that we are really worthy of being loved by him or believing that he really does forgive us or that he's near to us. So Lord, I just wanna pray over these things that, that are on our hearts that perhaps we want to believe but we need help with our unbelief. Lord, may you shine light on them. Show us in a tangible way these things that we're kind of wrestling with. Show us your love in a way that is undeniable. That will be a story that we will tell over and over again for years to come because we are just so amazed by how you who you say you are. We believe that we are who you say we are, as hard as that can be sometimes. Lord, show us how to walk in that today. We believe in you. We believe in you. the voice to sing, I believe. I believe in God. There's something to the congregation, to the people singing praises to the Lord God Almighty, the one who is and is to come. So I wanna sing this simple chorus. Holy are you, Lord God Almighty. Worthy is the Lamb, worthy to receive all glory, honor, and blessing. Let's just lift this up and make it a corporate cry that God, we declare you are worthy. We believe it. We prophesy it with our mouths this morning. The one who is and is to come is here in the room. So every voice, sing it with me. Sing holy. 
and holy, holy, are you, Lord God Almighty, and worthy is the Lamb, and worthy is the Lamb, for you.
declaration saying, we believe this is who Jesus is today. We believe he is who he says he is. Father, thank you. Thank you that you are worthy. You are worthy. We're so grateful, Lord, for all that you've done, continue to do in and through our lives. We're grateful to be here this morning on this beautiful day. We're thankful that while we were your enemies, you died for us. We're so grateful. Thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you. Welcome. On this gorgeous, beautiful, I don't know, is it spring yet? Is it? <laughs> A few, yeah. It doesn't have to do with some kind of bush or something here. You know what I mean? People are like, hey, it's blueberry or something, spring. What is it? 
Red Bud. In Seattle, that's a drug. So uh, that's all I'm saying. <laughs> wow, that's the way to start. Mm. So, um, so my name's Jamie. Um, I, I get to be part of the outreach team here, <clears throat> which is uh, re- it's really an interesting team, and it's an interesting um, position to play a part of. And so I get, I get to do a lot of fascinating stuff. But w- like one of the things I get to do is, so when, when, because the goal, of our, the, the goal of Christ Fellowship is to export what we do, which I love. It's not about building some kind of empire here. It's about exporting out into the community and into the world um, the things that Christ has given us. And uh, a few weeks ago, we were in Istanbul, and, and then out here in the community, it's really, really interesting. So sometimes people call here, and I have to call them back, you know, to see what it, they're looking for, what they need. And so I, th- I got a message <laughs> to call back this person. So I, and I don't necessarily know who they are, so I call this person, and this lady answers the phone, and, um, you know, she sounds to me to be on in years, and she answers the phone, and I said, hi, this is Jamie Winship from Christ Fellowship Church, and she says, isn't that a girl's name? And I was mad at my dad once again, many times in my life. Like, I don't know, dad, why, why? My older brother and younger brother have these long, amazing three-part names, family names. I'm Jamie, no middle name. Why, dad? I don't know, I was busy. And you had a twin sister, I had to think of two names. Usually I'd give one person two names, so I just split them. And so I say to the lady, which is odd, you know, why would you say to a man whose name is Jamie, isn't that a girl's name? And I said, well, it could be a girl's name, but it's more of a either or, both sexes thing, which is not the right thing to say back, that I thought about. She goes, well, I don't agree with that. <laughs> I don't know what she didn't agree with, but I'm not sure what I said either, so I just said, what, what, what how can we help you? And, <laughs> she's like, she started reading from a script, you know, like a volunteer. Like she starts reading from a script and it was about Christmas boxes and it was really sweet. And she's like, how many Christmas boxes did you do last year, Mr. Winship? And I said, you can call me Jamie. <laughs> nope, I'm calling you Mr. Winship. So we did this whole, I wish I recorded this conversation. It was so stunning. You know, that's one of those ones where you just look at your phone going, what? How many Christmas boxes did you last year? I don't, I don't exactly know. I'll tell you how many you did. She knew. Why are you asking me if you already know? <laughs> Some kind of quiz. <laughs> she goes, are you planning to do more this year? I'm like, I guess. I think you should do 25 more this year. I'm like, wow. Do you need help advertising? I said, no, I, actually our church is really generous. Here's some things I would suggest. Do you have a CD player? I'm like, I don't think anyone's had a CD player (laughs) since men were named Jamie. I don't know, it's been a long time. (laughs) So, we're not doing Christmas boxes this year. (laughs) We are, I'm just kidding, we are doing that. Um, So, what am I talking about? Oh yeah, part of outreach. (laughs) So we, me and a bunch of other great people get to do this kind of thing. And so one of the things I was doing a few weeks ago was I got to be with a bunch of high school kids, not our, not our high school kids, but out in the community, and it was a great group. And uh, we were talking about identity, which is what we talk about here a lot, hearing from God and understanding who you are, and then how do you help other people discover who they are in Christ. And um, so I was with this group of 30 or so high school kids, and we were reading through, um, because they were from, they had a a Christian tradition, and so I was reading from Judges with them, Judges chapter 6, and we were talking about Gideon, and and how Gideon didn't know his identity, then he learned his identity, but the beginning of that Judges chapter 6 is talking about Israel being in 
uh, this bad situation because the Midianites are coming in and stealing everything they have. So the, the Israelites would plant food and harvest it, and then the Midianites would come in and steal it all. And I was asking them, are things in your life where you work on, and like you get them going, and then something just comes and steals them away? Like, how does that happen? Does it happen in your life? And we were talking about, yes, it does. And so then I asked them, tell me who in Judges chapter 6 is the enemy of the Israelites? Who's the real enemy of the Israelites? And they were wrestling through it and thinking through it. And one of the, one of the guys said, um, their enemy is God. I, have, I, I was like, wow. Hmm. And so we started talking about that. Is God ever our enemy? Because if God is our enemy, then that means that we have to self-protect against God deep in our hearts. So we really got into that. And I, uh, my question then is, and I ask people this all the time, especially people that aren't from a faith background, but do you believe deep in your heart that that the universe or the world is for you or against you? Now, I mean, it depends who you ask, when you ask them in their life. But many people deep down believe they're kind of in an uphill battle. That it's kind of like I'm just, you know, kind of Hemingway-ish. Like I'm battling against nature and all of it. And in the end, it might all just get snatched away from me. And so, but then I was thinking as Christians, as people that grow up in, in some kind of biblical teaching, are we taught early on in our life, maybe not intentionally, that God is somehow against us because he's mad at us, because we're shameful, and he's got to do something about what we did wrong. Because he's mad and he's got to do something with that anger. That's a God who is your enemy. And so then, well, what's the rescue? The rescue is God has to kill his son to placate that anger. Wow. Is it all the way gone? Mostly. But not all the way. Because I can still feel him judging me. Even after the cross, even after all, I'm still pretty disappointed. Not that mad because Jesus died, but still pretty disappointed. And God is my enemy. And so when you're inviting people into, hey, let's meet with God together, deep down they're like, I don't want to. <laughs> they may pray with you, but they don't want to. Because, why? Because he's mad at me. And how intimate and vulnerable are you going to be with someone that you're afraid is mad at you? You'll just do the works of religion, but to have a deep, intimate relationship, any relationship, any human relationship that is sourced and begins in fear, it's very hard to change it to something else. It stays based in fear. Is God for you or against you? So he is for, thank you for that. He is for, how do we know he's for us? So we know the scriptures, Christ died for, he demonstrated his love to us in that while we were his enemies, Christ died for us. Yeah, I know this, I know it. Is he for me every day? I don't know. I know the verses. I don't know if I know this. You know, it's like one time our little son, when he was young, he's 30 two now, but when he was little, he was in Awana, and I love Awana, they're awesome, and he, had a, he was a cubby, if you know Awana, and he had a little blue vest, which he loved so much, and he was getting the patches, and, saying, and so he, he, he said to me, Dad, I can, I, you want to hear my verse? Yeah, and he says a verse, and I don't remember what it was, but it was long, and it was impressive, and I said, wow, that is great that you know that. Do you know what that means? And he goes, oh, yeah. What does it mean? I get a pencil. Like, see, that's not what I'm talking, not that kind of relationship. <laughs> it's like a reward and retribution relationship. If you say the right thing, you get this. If you don't, you don't get it. And that's an enemy that does that to you. It's manipulative. 
But so how do we know about God? So we've been doing this series here on focusing on Jesus, and Ray was talking about resting and relaxing, and, um, and Derek's doing all the rest about that. And I, I was actually sitting in an airport last Sunday watching the service. I, I, I hate when I'm not here. I really miss it for lots of different reasons. And so, um, and so when I got the opportunity to come up here in this series, this is what was on my mind, this discussion. So when we look at Jesus, what's one of the great values of looking at Jesus? Here it is. Here's what it is. God is like Jesus. Think about that for a second. So if we say, what is God like? The answer is Jesus. God is like Jesus. Is Jesus like God? Yes. Yes. But this God, Yahweh, the I am that I am, is the invisible God. That's the description. And no one can see this and live. So what do we know about this? What do we know about this one? Is this one mad? Judgmental? Waiting to throw people into eternal conscious torment. That, is that it? Wipes out whole nations. That, we haven't seen it. We haven't seen him. We've heard people talk about him. We've heard people say, this is what we think he does or wants us to do. But we haven't seen him until Jesus. And then suddenly we can see the unseeable one. And so God is like Jesus. That's an astounding statement. That is an astounding. I never met that Jesus when I was growing up. I met this God, but I never met the God that was like this. What, so here, here's what the scripture says about that. Jesus says it in John 14. You know this. If you have seen me, you have seen. You mean you're like him? He is like you. We are the same. John 12. When he, anyone, looks at me, Jesus, he sees the one who has sent me. How clear is that? What does God do with enemies? What did Jesus do? Then the other writers start to write about it. Hebrews, the sun is the radiance of God's glory and the exact representation of his being. Not close to. Jesus is a nicer version of God. No. It's not like Jesus, good guy, God, bad guy. Hang out with the good guy, avoid the bad guy. The good guy came so the bad guy can't really see you. That's what we teach. It's not right. The sun is the radiance of God's glory and the exact representation of his being, Paul says in Colossians. He, Jesus, is the image of the invisible God. What does the invisible God look like? Jesus. That clear, that simple. Second Corinthians, the glory of Christ, who is the image of God. Colossians 2, for in Christ all the fullness of the deity lives in bodily form. God is like Jesus. If you want to know what God would do in a given situation, it has to align with Jesus. It has to. The word of God in the scriptures is not the Bible. The word of God, the title word of God is only ever applied to Jesus. Not to a book, to the person who is the exact representation of the invisible God and only says what the invisible God says and only does what the invisible God does. That's why we, what did Jesus come to do? He came to take away sin. Yes, he did. Why? Because he's demonstrating to us the invisible God and how the invisible God thinks and moves. And if that doesn't make you want to love the invisible God, I don't know what will. Because there he is. And the invisible God wants to serve you. The invisible God wants to serve you. The Son of Man didn't come to be served. He came to serve. He came to wash your feet. Yahweh, what do you want to do, almighty God? Wash your feet. What? I think I'm scared I didn't have a quiet time. You want to wash my feet? I think you're mad at me because I didn't witness to anybody today. 
You want to wash my feet? Oh, here's what Martin Luther wrote. Luther, the great church father, writer, back, back in one of his works called The Last Words of David. This is how strongly he says it, talking about, talking about Jesus and God. Here's what he says. Thus it follows powerful, powerfully and irrefutably, that's a fairly strong opinion, that the God who led the people of Israel out of Egypt and through the Red Sea, who guided them in the wilderness through the pillars of cloud and fire, which the pillars of cloud and fire are how the people could see God, the invisible one. He's invisible. What do you see? Pillar, fire, cloud. That's what we see. Martin Luther, who guided them in the wilderness through the pillars of cloud and fire, who nourished them with heavenly bread and who performed all the miracles Moses describes in his book, who also brought them into the land of Canaan and then gave them kings and priests and everything is therefore God and none other than Jesus of Nazareth. That's like, what? The son of the Virgin Mary, whom we call Christ, our God and Lord. And again, it is he who gave Moses the Ten Commandments on Mount Sinai, saying, I am the Lord your God who led you out of Egypt. You shall have no other gods. Yes, Jesus of Nazareth, who died for us on the cross, is the God who says in the first commandment, I am the Lord, I am your God. Jesus. Wow. So when God is here, what does he do in all the different situations? And this is why we need the model of Christ, to know what would God do. So then you start reading the Gospels, and it's like astounding. It's not like that guy. That guy washed my feet. The I am of the Old Testament just washed your feet. The, the incarnate one, the one who is before all things, the one who holds all things together, the one who by whom all things were created is washing your feet. And if you say you don't want him to wash your feet, you are nuts. <laughs> Peter, sorry. And the God I am says, if I don't wash your feet, you have nothing to do with me. If you don't let me serve you, you have nothing to do with me. It's not because I'm mad at you. It's because you won't receive what I want to serve to you. Right? Say, so God, what do you want me to do? Receive from me. God, what do you want me to do today? What are the things that and if I don't do them, you're going to be mad? I'm not wrong. So if we, look at the, if we look at the Gospels and we're focusing on Jesus, this is what's so important. He came to take away the sin of the world. He came to make people well. But he came to show us who God really is because we get it wrong all the time. Because we want God to be the God that kills people we don't like or punishes people we don't like. That's what we want. But it, unfortunately, that's the frustrating, frustrating thing about Jesus. He's not like that. So I'm going to look at, if you have a Bible, let's look together at this. I hope you'll find this interesting. Um, I'm just going to read through Mark a little bit, starting in chapter 3. And I want, you to, I want you to watch two things. I want you to watch these two prepositions of place. That Mark's always got people moving around, and he's big on where they are, where they're standing. Like Jesus is in the line of sinners. Then he gets baptized. Now he's over here as the son of God. How'd that happen? But then he never explains anything. Then he just goes on to the next story. Like, wait a second. Why, why is the I am standing in the line of sinful people? Why does he have to be baptized? There he gets baptized. Oh, his identity. He's the son of God. And then he goes off. And, like, why did that happen? And Mark's on. He's gone into something else. I don't know. Figure it out. Pray about it. We're going on to the next thing. Immediately thereafter, that's how he talks. It's always like this boom, 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 preposition, move, let's go. So here he is in, in chapter 3, verse 13. And he's talking about the selection of the disciples. So chapter 3, verse 13, this is, this is what he says. And he, Jesus, went up to the mountain. So I'm going to I'm gonna give you the expanded translation, but you'll see it in whatever you're looking at. But I want you to look at the word with, with, with. The preposition with, like this. And with, in Aramaic, it, and Hebrew means to move toward. It doesn't mean to stand next to. That's the word next to. With means to constantly be moving toward. So you can't get all the way with someone because you're continually moving closer and closer to them all the time. It's the idea of abiding in them. So listen what Mark says. And Jesus went up onto the mountain and he called to be with him. 
with him, those whom he desired to be with him, in order that they would be with him, and they came to him to be with him, trying to make a point there, in order that he might send them out. With, 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 send. To do what? Be with, 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 with. To send, and then to be with, 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 and that's the pattern of a movement. It begins with, with. So what is God going to call Jesus? Emmanuel, God with us. Because God is like Jesus and he wants to be with you. Wow, that's amazing, Mark. And we're moving on. Verse 20. Then Jesus went home, probably to Peter's house, and a crowd gathered there. Now watch these prepositions. So they go in a house. They go home into, they're in a house, in a home. And a crowd gathered there with them in and with, so that they could not even eat. There was so much inness and withness that food was not important. Wow. Wow. And when his family heard of it, his family aren't in and with. His family are outside. And when his family heard it, they went out to seize him, for they were saying, he is out of his mind. His own family are not in and with. They're out, saying Jesus isn't in his right mind. He's out of his right mind. Have you ever had anyone in your family think that you're out of your mind? <laughs> and you think things are going well, and then you find like, yeah, yeah, no, all along we thought you were out of your mind. We just smile at you just to keep the peace, but really. <laughs> so they're outside, his own family's outside saying he's out of his mind. But those who are with him are inside and they are, and he is in his right mind. Here's my question. Where are you? Where are you? So if we had a lot of time, we could just write, read through this and, and, they, and the scribes and the Pharisees come down from Jerusalem and they're standing outside and they're saying, We'll tell you what's inside him. It's the devil. <laughs> That's the thing. He's possessed. Inside of, inside of this guy who's out of his mind, inside of him is Satan. And then Jesus says, if Satan is inside of someone, then how can they be against the enemy? The house divided will fall. So that can't be right. And then he says this really super interesting thing. He says, no one can enter a strong man's house and plunder his goods unless he first binds the strong man. So then Jesus is saying, let me tell you something. For someone to come into this house, your house, they first have to bind the one that lives there. Because this one that lives there won't let Christ in, which is me and you. That's what he's talking about. So you have to bind the strong man and remove the strong man. Then the other may come in. It's really fascinating. So it's like if you're listening to Jesus say these things and then he talks about what happens if you don't let the Holy Spirit in. Then, they can't, then the, the, your sins cannot be canceled. You must let the Holy Spirit in. in. Let him in. Let him in. Let him in. Why? Because the Son of Man came to serve you. Why? Because God wants to be with you, in you. Who can keep him out? Only you. Then, verse 31, and his mother and his brothers came standing still outside. They sent to him and called to him. They're not with him. They're not in with him. They're calling to him. And a crowd was sitting around him, with him. And he said, and they said to him, your mother and your brothers are outside. Perhaps they named you a girl's name. It could be, I don't know. Your mother and brothers are outside seeking you. Where are they seeking him from? Outside. And he answered them, 
Who are my mother and my brothers? And looking around at those who sat with him, toward him, and him moving toward them, he said, here is my mother and my brothers. For whoever does the will of God, he is my brother and sister and mother. Who? Those with me, and I am with them. Them. Not those standing outside calling to me. And then, in chapter 4, he tells the amazing parable of the sower, which is his first parable. Jesus starts to proclaim the kingdom. And what's interesting is some guy on the internet decided to count all the times the, the disciples failed Jesus. If you don't have anything to do, I guess that's something to do. How many times did the disciples fail Jesus? He calls them disciple failures and screw-ups. How many, how many times? He counted 31 times in the Gospels. 31 times the disciples blow it. And how many times does God, the great I am, I am, forgive them? How many times? 31. Every time. So what does God do with sinners? Forgives them. How many times? Every time. Amen. Every single time. Even though he's telling them, like, do this, don't do that, and they do it. He never accuses them or shames them. Never Never, never, never. Why? Because God doesn't accuse and shame. How do you know? There he is right there. He doesn't do it. With anyone, even the bad people, even the tax collectors and the Romans and the prostitutes and all of it, not even them. So he tells this parable of the sower, and here's his big, the explanation. If you know this famous parable, there's a guy that has seed, it's God, and Jesus in the kingdom, and Jesus is gonna spread the good news of the kingdom, and he spreads it everywhere. Everywhere. Every corner, every place, everywhere he throws that seed. It's kind of an idea of where should we share the kingdom? Everywhere. And he throws it out there. He does, it doesn't matter what the soil is that it hits. It doesn't matter. He's reseeding the world. He, the, 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 in an intertestamental period from the end of the prophets to the dark silence of 400 years, waiting for the Messiah to come. And then he comes. He has to come back in and reseed a field that's just gone fallow. <laughs> They've lost the real word love. They don't know what it is. All they know is God is a judge. He punishes. How do you know you're punished? You're poor. If God loved you, you'd be wealthy and you'd be white and you'd be a Pharisee, but you're not and you're sick. And, that, and, that, and it's like this barren, fallow, religious wasteland of judgment and conflict. And Jesus comes in and he starts just throwing the seed because he's the word. And these words have to be redefined. You think that's what love is? I'll tell you what love is. I will die for you and you're my enemy. That's love. Stop using love in these other situations. I love my country. What? And he redefines all of these words. What is sin? What is truth? What is righteousness? All these words. What is peace? Peace is something the world doesn't understand. Unless you have Christ. That's what he's doing. He's throwing the seed everywhere. And the challenge is not, does, does God love everyone? He does. It's not, does God sow his word everywhere in the world all the time? He does. Amen. The question is, what do you do with it when the seed comes to you? That's the only question of the parable. And he tells them in parables. Verse 10, this is chapter 4. And when he was alone, those with him... With the 12, those around him, there's a two with, those around him and with the 12, so there's this bigger group, asked him about the parables. And he said to them, to you, who? You who are with me. To you has been given the secret of the kingdom of God. But for those outside, everything is in parables. So that, and then he quotes Isaiah, so that they, the ones on the outside, may indeed see but not perceive, 
may indeed hear but not understand, lest they should turn and be forgiven. What he's saying is you cannot play a game with this and try and stand on the outside of intimacy with Jesus, intimacy with Jesus and get it. You won't. The only way to get it is to come inside and be with him and he with you is the only way. And all Jesus is saying, I'm going to say this, and if you don't get it, come ask me. Come on, anyone, come ask me. And some do, but a lot go, that was a dumb story. I didn't get that, that was a boring passage. And they just wander away. But some soil, let it go deep. And they're like, what in the world did that mean? And to them... He explains it. So, Tom, put that verse up there, would you? This is Mark 4, 33. This is the one slide I made because I'm never prepared. But this is the slide I love. This is the one. This passage has been on my mind so much in the last few weeks. This is describing God in Christ. With many stories like these, like the parables... He presented his message to them, the ones with him, fitting the stories to their experience and maturity. He's fitting the parables to us if we will come ask him what they mean. He was never without a story when he spoke. When he was alone with his disciples, he went over everything. Look at this message translation. Look what he's doing with them. Sorting out the tangles and untying the knots. That's what he's doing. Here, here's what he wants to do with you and he, when he washes your feet and he dies on the cross for you. He wants, he wants to sort out your tangles and untie your knots that are all right here that are killing us. They're all knotted up and it's all tangled up in my mind. And what's happening in the Ukraine? And I don't know. And the gas prices and it's all untangling. Go be with him and ask him that question. That's the invitation. That is the invitation. Come on. And here's the only two things you can say, yes or no. That's, it's that simple. What is God like? God is like Jesus. So last week, I, I got invited, part of our outreach, to go speak to some folks that are in Silicon Valley. And they're a great group of people. And their question is, how do we have a movement in Silicon Valley? So I, I don't know why they asked me. I've never even been there. But... Oh, okay, so what am I going to do? So I go to God, and I sit with them, and I ask this question. What would you, like if you were going out to speak in Silicon Valley, what would you say? This is how practical Jesus is trying to get us to be with him. I'll help you with that. Have you ever been to Silicon Valley? Yes. It's omnipresent. Kind of been everywhere. So, but will he tell me? Will he tell me? Will God tell you? Or is God up there like, I don't know, did you pray enough? Did you pray long enough? Did you, I don't know, did you ask me in the right way? I'm just gonna tell you anything. Yes, he will. But here's what he has to do. Ask, knock, seek. Ask, knock, seek. He says it all the time. Come, he who asks, he gets answered. He who seeks, finds. He who knocks, the doors are open. How often do we knock? All the time. Keep knocking. Keep asking about everything. Ask and be with the one that will untangle you and untie you and let you be free. And so I, I, I get on the plane to go out there, you know, at our airport here at 6 a.m. And, um, and I don't have an answer. And I get on the plane <laughs> and I'm sitting there and God, you know how long this flight is. So <laughs> I'll, considering the time change and all, you know, I don't have any idea what to say to these folks. And so on the plane comes this person that's going to sit next to me. And the person comes on and clearly having a very, very bad morning. Because, you know, all of us are like this. It's like they're, so, they're all disheveled and their bag's half open and stuff's spilling out. And their mask is like <laughs> protecting their ear from infection. You know, it's like, it's just like, it's a, and they're just like, and you, everyone on the, on the plane of, you know, 18 of us are like, wow. We all know what that's like. Whatever it is, we've all been there. 
Some of us are in it right now. And this person comes down the aisle, you know, and I, I know they're coming here. And I jump up, and they're like, can I help you? Their bag, they just go, and give me their bag, you know, like this. And, and their phone falls on the floor, and they gotta bend down on the floor. And those planes are little, you know? And so we're doing this dance and banging people, and, and uh, the person says, this is the worst day. This is the worst morning. You would not believe what happened to me this morning. And putting their stuff up, and we're saying, uh, I got stuck inside the gate in my gated community. I could not get out. <laughs> Don't you just drive up, and it goes like, oh, no. That's supposed to happen, but it didn't work, so I had to get out of my car, run around, and hit the dinker from the front, and it would go up, and then I'd have to run around and try and jump in my car, and guess what? I'm not fast enough. And I'm like, I don't even know, how does that happen? Like, is that possible? And then, on the third run, so they were pretty tired when they got to the plane, uh, I dropped the dinker, and it shattered. And so then I didn't have a light, so I was down on the ground, searching for all the pieces of the dinker. Do you know what I mean? I'm like, no, no I, I don't know. And I, but I found all the pieces. You, like, this is a miracle story. This is like a missionary miracles. You found all the pieces in the dark, yeah, and I reassembled the dinker. You did? Yeah, and, it's, and anyway, I still couldn't get, so I called Uber. And she go, the person goes, you know what? They don't have Uber here. And I'm like, where are you from? Guess where they were from? Silicon Valley. <laughs> I just moved here, just moved here. Welcome, I said, welcome. Um, just moved here, I love it here. It's amazing here, I'm having a bad morning, but it's amazing here. But yeah, I've been in Silicon Valley my whole life and you know, I, this was my vocation out there and I'm like, oh my gosh. And um, not a very happy person, but from Silicon Valley, new here, and I said, oh good, people here, they love more people to come from California here, that's what they, people here like. And uh, <laughs> welcome. <laughs> and I said, I just moved here too. I've been here a little more than a year from Seattle. And she's like, oh, yeah, oh, gosh, oh, I bet you were glad to get out of Seattle, all this kind of thing. And so plane takes off, and I'm asking the Lord, what do I do? <laughs> this is a person that can, uh, they're from Silicon Valley, they can reassemble a dinker in the dark. <laughs> this is a high-tech person. <laughs> I would have just stomped on the dinker myself and gone back to bed. That's what I would have done and said God was against me. <laughs> if that gate doesn't come open, God's against me. So the person, so we're talking, this person's telling me their life, and it's a rough life, actually. And so we're at cruising altitude. And, uh, it's a 42-minute flight. So I, my question to the untire of knots is, can can you show me how to do this in less than 42 minutes? Because the person was on their way to their Caribbean getaway to rest. Yeah, that's what I said. Oh, hmm. And <laughs> you mean like destined? No, further than that. So, okay. So, so it's like, so wealthy person just moved here, Silicon Valley, exactly the demographic I'm gonna go talk to. So the person finally says to me, what is it that you do? Yeah, and I'm like, hmm, what do I do? What should I say? This is a lot of answers to that question. Some is asking, Lord, what, what do I do? And I say to the person, this seemed appropriate, I work with people that are in conflict. <laughs> and the person goes, well, yeah, <laughs> okay, that's a lot of people. And I said, I know. How do, you, how do you work with them in conflict? Well, it's about identity, actually. It's, it's more about identity than conflict. Really, yeah, what does that mean? And I said, well, um, like for example, and I, I wanted to say something that would really like bing, shift the conversation all the way over to an area where they're not familiar. And I said, well, for example, when you're dealing with radical Muslim terrorists, they just went. <laughs> and I just looked. That's what I said, yep. That's what I, it's harder than a dinker at night. <laughs> and, and the person said, what, what do you do? And I said, well, here's what we do. First, we get them to make a list of all the names that they call themselves that hurt them. You know, have you had, I say to the person, have you had people in your life that have said things about you that hurt your feelings? Yes. But they go deep. They last for years, don't they? Yes, I'm divorced. Yes, I'm, I, I'm, I, I, yes. 
Could you list those names? Yes, I could. That's what we make them do, write them down. Just, in fact, we just sit out at night in the desert because the desert is sacred to them. And we sit out there and we just write down all the names I believe about myself that are not true and they hurt me. I'm a disappointment. I'm a blah, 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 blah. Write them down like that. And the person just turns, sits back in their seat and just leans their head back. And I said, and then we envision unconditional love with us. It's not in us, it's of us. It's with us, and it wants to be with us. Unconditional love, whatever that is. Beautiful, unconditional love, truth, and beauty is with us. And we give the false names to unconditional love, and we let them go, and we watch them go. <laughs> 22 minutes, here we go, down into Atlanta. Let them go. And then, when they're gone, then we look up into the night sky and say, God, or love, what do you call? And then they come back after they've been out there all night and they come back around the fire as the sun's coming up and we go around the room and say, what did God call you? What did love say about you? And they start to say, and what did God call you? Poet. What did God call you? Beloved. Not most Christian. No. Poet, beloved. Healer. And the person next to me goes, Warrior. Warrior, the person heard God call them on the plane, warrior. And they, they just yelled it out. It was so funny. I was going, poet, healer, warrior. <laughs> I am warrior. Identity. Only God gives identity like that. Why is God talking to this disheveled, person who doesn't probably know a lot about God because he throws the seed everywhere. <laughs> and it's just our part to be witnesses and help that ground soften up. It's called witnessing. I've seen this happen with Muslims out in the desert. It's happened in my own life. It can happen on this little tiny plane going, descending into Atlanta. What does love call you? What does God call you? Disappointed, divorced, no. Warrior, And that person was so thrilled they didn't know what to do. We land, we go into the airport, we part ways. Give them my phone number. <clears throat> that person has been texting me every single day from a beautiful, gorgeous place in the Caribbean. <laughs> um, look where the warrior is today. <laughs> you know, that kind of thing. And uh, every single day, cannot wait to get back up here and get in a community that knows identity can hear from God like that. Yeah, yeah. Donna, come out here, please. Donna's gonna walk us through communion. This is my wife. Um, three o'clock, I don't know, yesterday in the morning, my text goes off, and it was this person <laughs> texting me just what's going on in their mind and hearing out there and wherever they are and just hearing and, the, and the, the God who doesn't stop talking, the God who's constantly calling forth. And the, here's the thing, the goal is he wants to be with you. The only one that can prevent that is us. I'm challenging you this morning, don't stand outside. Come inside with Jesus, sit with him, and what better place than in the communion that we're gonna do right now. This is the place where Jesus is saying by his blood and by his body, he is welcoming us to be with him. And so let's say yes to that. So Donna's gonna walk us through it. There was a little girl who really loved Jesus with all her heart in just the sweetest way and wanted to take communion <clears throat> but didn't really understand it. I think it's difficult for even us as adults to understand the the bread representing, I'm eating his body, I'm drinking his blood. And so her precious grandmother described it to her this way. His body is broken for you, so you will always know how much he loves you. And his blood was shed for you, so you will always know that you are never alone. He's always with you always with you. We're fortunate today that um, we're coming up to Holy Week 
And it's pretty profound that this year, this doesn't happen very often, but this year, Good Friday, April 15th, is also actually the first night of the Jewish holiday, Passover. And Passover is the festival that Jews celebrate that commemorates Moses leading the people out of Egypt, away from slavery, delivering them from the life of slaves at the risk of death from Pharaoh into the promised land. And the night that happens, listen to the symbolism of this, the night that that happened in, in the Exodus story, all the Jewish families had to kill a lamb and, and take the blood of the lamb and paint it over the doorpost of their house, the threshold of their house. And that blood signified that they were safe. And when the angel of death passed over Egypt, all who had the blood over the threshold of their house were safe and were saved. Jews to this day celebrate the Passover with a meal called the Seder. And at that meal, there's a lot of symbolism. One is the matzah, which is the bread that they didn't have time to rise. And as they were fleeing out of Egypt, they put the bread dough on their backs and the sun baked it and it never rised and it's called matzah. And another symbol is the wine, which as we know from scripture, they drank often. And so Jesus at the last supper, he tells the disciples a few days before, go to this man and tell him we need a place to celebrate the Seder because it's the Passover's coming. And so they're there and they're celebrating the Seder and it's the Last Supper. And all the symbols of the Passover are on the table. There's probably about 11, 10 symbols of the Passover that you go through each one. And we know what Paul exhorts us in 1 Corinthians is don't come to this table, don't come to this feast don't come to communion. If you have an offense in your heart, if you have a grievance in your heart against someone, if you have a grievance of your own self, a, a sin in your own heart that you've never dealt with. So before we say the prayers and the blessings over the matzah and the wine and take communion together, let's just take a minute. Is there anyone that's offended you, that's keeping you from fully being with God? because God's forgiven you and he commands us to forgive. They know not what they do, forgive. Is there anything in your own life that you need to receive his forgiveness for? He wants to forgive you. He's right there with you in it. Remember, he's with us. So just quietly bring those things before the Lord. Just give it to the Lord. And if you don't understand, ask him because he'll explain everything to you fully and untie those knots. Just simple question, God, what do you want me to know? So let's pray. Give those things to the Lord. Forgive and receive forgiveness. Forgiveness is the oxygen we breathe in the kingdom of God. It makes us free. No longer slaves. So on that night in the upper room, Jesus took the matzah as they were celebrating the Seder. And he gave thanks and he broke it. And he said, this is my body broken for you. Do this in remembrance of me. But then I believe he probably said the Hebrew prayer that Jewish families have been saying since the beginning of, since Abraham, 
at the Sabbath, Shabbat dinners every Friday night, and then especially at the Seder. And it goes like this, Baruch Ata Adonai Eloheinu Melech HaOlam Hamotzi Lechem Min HaAretz. It means, blessed art thou, O Lord our God, King of the universe, who's given us this bread from the earth. Let's take and eat and remember that God loves you. And he took the wine and he probably prayed like this Baruch Ata Adunai Eloheinu Melech HaOlam Bare Peri HaGafen. Blessed art thou, O Lord our God, King of the universe, who's given us fruit from the vine. And as you drink, remember this is his blood that was shed for you, so you will always know that you're never alone that he's with you. Thank you. Let's pray. Lord, thank you for, I thank you for the person beside me on the plane. So looking forward to that relationship and that person being in our community, but more, Lord, than being in your community. Just thank you for that. Thank you, Lord, that you are the one who untangles us and unties our knots, and that if we'll come to you, you'll explain everything to us fully because you want to be with us. You long to be with us. And Father, I just pray this morning for anyone, for anyone who is not with you, that they would welcome you in, Lord, that they would welcome the God who came to be with us. So that's just so simple to do. It's just say yes to the Lord. Yes, I want to be with you. I don't understand all that that means, but I'm tired of this tangle and knot of a life that I'm in, and I just want to be with you, the one who loves me, the one who gave himself for me, and just say yes. And Lord, we say as Christ Fellowship, as a community, we say yes to you. And in going out into the world, we say yes to you. We thank you for these things in Christ's name. Amen. What a beautiful morning it has been. Thank you, Jamie. I'm going to invite our prayer teams on up this morning. And as they're coming, you know, we've shared with you before that we do have intercessory teams that are praying each and every service over all of us, which is just so sweet. Uh, but there is also something that goes on on Sunday morning you may not be aware of. We actually have, um, as an opportunity for you, a prophetic ministry time where you can go on our website and under our prophetic ministry page, you can sign up to have a time with a couple of our prophetic team members. We'll pray with you, we pray for you, we pray over you, and it's a very sweet time together. So if you're interested in that, check that out, go on the website, find that prophetic ministry page and sign up for that. And specifically today, uh, if this is the first time that you have reached out and said, yes, I want to be with God and come in, uh, let us pray with you. Come up and let one of these people know. Let us just pray over you and bless that. Um, we love you all. Go out and enjoy this beautiful day. <laughs>